the Federal Reserve has now injected well over $4 trillion into the repo markets and $326 billion in buying up short-term treasuries. All of that is to undo the yield curve inversion that warned us of a recession on the way and to prevent the money markets from freezing up and becoming visible to the public. But regardless of their words, which are really designed to lull the public into a false sense of security, they are clearly in panic mode. And I think that they're using up their last ounce of unlimited money printing credibility. So, you know, you think that the biggest threat is the, Ch the U.S.-China trade war? Well, how about a default wall that is expected to explode in 2020? This and more is what we're going to look at coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the crisis that, quite frankly, we've already been walking through. And I know that a lot of people think that, you know, oh, you've been saying this for a long time. I can't tell you exactly the moment when it will become visible to you, but what I can do and what I do do is show you how the foundation of frankly, not just the monetary system, but our very way of life, I'm showing you how that is eroding. It may happen on Tuesday morning at 835, but I can't give you that date. I can show you what's happening. If you want to know more about that, just check out the video, The Jenga Economy. But what I need to talk to you about today, first I'm going to give you a little update on the repo markets so and the, uh, and the money injection in the short-term treasuries so you can see for yourself. They want you to think that everything is just A-OK. -okay. And I've also had enough people ask me about, you know, well, how come we don't know about this? And where did all the inflation go? Well, if you're really looking for the inflation, you look no further than the stock markets and the bond markets and the real estate markets that were specifically targeted for reflation. But also don't forget to look at your medical bills, your food bills, your gas bills, your insurance bills, all of those things that somehow don't really seem to make it into not even hitting their 2% projections. But this becomes really critical because they are now actively talking about running above their 2% target because they know that they're using up in these operations the last bit of money printing credibility that they have. And this is a con game and it requires confidence. And I was talking to somebody earlier today that came into the office that there isn't really almost a day or a session that goes by as I'm reading article after article after article where I'm not seeing somebody question the credibility of these central banks. But they know that all this money printing isn't really going to work because they know that the more they do, the less of an impact that it has. Just like any person that's addicted to drugs, they need more and more and more just to feel normal. Well, what we're in is not normal. But hey, the Fed, they're going to op they're open to adjusting regulations, taking away your protections just to keep everything appearing stable while the foundation is frankly rotting. This is what we have to look at because if they use up all this ammo here, well, what are they going to have to work with when the crisis becomes visible to you? They're already battling the crisis. Make no mistake about it. 
the biz, the Bank for International Settlements, so the central bankers, the central bankers central bank, which is also owned by all those central banks, so it's still private. But they're talking about the fact that what created all the problem in the repo markets are hedge funds. Well, hedge funds are typically trader. It's hot money. It's in and out. It's in and out. Is that really what you want guiding the foundation of the global economy? I showed you that the, uh, the VIX, the volatility chart on the treasuries last week. Because what they also talked about is the fact that there is a liquidity mismatch. In other words, you've got four, count them four, not a million, four of the big banks that dominate the repo market. But they only hold 25% of their reserves in cash. Well, cash, at least at this juncture, is instantly liquid. But 50% of the market treasuries that are in the financial and the banking system, those four banks hold 50% of the treasuries. Well, wait a minute. Treasuries are supposed to be very liquid. Well, not when you've got a whole bunch of demand at the same time. This is what I'm talking about with the stock markets. And so what happened is they couldn't convert those treasuries into the cash to fund the repo markets. And so the Federal Reserve had to step in and do that. And that's because of all of the QE. Um, in addition, the Treasury typically holds cash at the Federal Reserve, which helps with the bank reserves, but it's going to vary. So the resulting drain swings and reserves likely reduce the cash buffers of the big four banks. Okay, well, that's simple. That's what happened. And that's all about an unintended consequence of QE because they changed the very structure, the very nature of the banking system and of these repo markets because they've had such ample cash for so long. So what do they say? Oh, the internal processes and knowledge that banks need to ensure prompt and smooth market operations may have started to decay. You think? The foundation has decayed. The fact that you may or may not see this, I mean, hopefully you watch my work so you are seeing it. But for those that question, oh, nothing's happened. Let me tell you, by the time you see it, it's too late to do anything about it. What I'm trying to do is give you a heads up. Because what do the banks want to do? Well, they want to hold even less in reserve. And it looks like, frankly, they're going to get their wish. Because as I've shown you over the last several years, that there has been a serious decline in investor protections. Now, Paul Volcker, who was... He recently passed, but he was instrumental in getting us over the hump as we made the transition in the 70s and the early 80s from a gold standard to a pure debt-based fiat money standard. So he's been around the block a little bit. And in 2010 and 2008, when the crisis hit, he wanted the banks to stop trading for their own benefit. Well, I recently showed you an Office of the Comptroller of the Currency uh, chart, and you could see speculative derivatives here and those that are legitimate, in other words, insurance policies against, oh, let's say, you know, a farmer who's got to deliver their wheat in September and it's January and they have no idea what the weather's going to be or how the crop's going to turn out. Well, legitimately, they would use a derivative product to ensure that they made at least a minimum amount of money come September uh, in order to stay in business. But as he said, bankers know what proprietary trading is and is not. Don't let them tell you any different. So this past summer, we went over this, and Megan, maybe we can pull the link on that, how they changed uh, some of the, the uh, rules in the vocal rule that made a lot of trades exempt and also uh, opened it up to larger banks, small smaller banks, but still 
larger in uh, terms of the, the amount of deposits that they carry. That creates more risk for depositors. Now, they're considering additional exemptions on proprietary trading through, and I love this part, that's why I had to show it to you, taking risk in the investment funds that they offer to clients. And you don't even know it. That's disgusting to me. It's absolutely positively disgusting to me. But chances are pretty good these exemptions will also go through. So we forget all the lessons of 2008 because, boy, we just want those banks to have that liquidity. But what are they really going to do with the excess liquidity? Chances are pretty good they're going to take risks with it and not really make it available because, frankly, the Fed, the Fed has already let them know, no worries, we'll make sure that we keep creating all of this new money, new money. You think that has no impact? on its value, on everything else, it sure does. Because what they also know is that when the assets in bank run funds are tested in a recession, we'll find out if the weekend re regulations still work. Eh, I'm betting they don't. But I'm not betting my money that they don't because I wouldn't have one penny in this garbage. That's all it is. It's not for your benefit. It's for their benefit. Mr. Volcker foresaw the dangers that lurk in bank investments that expose them to risks. Well, of course he did. He lived through and actually managed, was instrumental in managing that transition from the gold standard to the debt standard. He knows this. Watchdogs are unwise to ignore his warnings. Isn't that a fact? But there's something else that I want to show you. And this, actually, I hadn't looked at it since last year. And so I pulled up every year. You can Google it, but you can also follow the links and you can go back however many years you want. But every year, the Bank of Canada does a report on government debt, sovereign debt defaults. Look at this. Okay, I've shown you this graph before because I've been following uh, these reports for a number of years. Oops, I forgot to grab my little laser pointer. All right, the red are ev advanced economies. And this spike here between 2013 and 2014 was the European debt crisis. Look at this. Look at the spike that took place in 2018. Hmm. You don't see any red back here, do you? Nope. You don't even see any red in 2014 and 15. Nope. But you start to see a little bit of advanced economies, government bond defaults. We're taught that these are the safest things that you can do. If a bank, if a government rather can print the money to repay its debts, then what's the likelihood of them defaulting? So if I'm seeing these spikes, I'm getting a little nervous about it. And frankly, I think that you should too. And there was a question in the Q&A yesterday, and it actually fell right into it. And that was on um, other governments or other corporations outside of the U.S. issuing U.S. dollar denominated bonds. And I said, well, of course they could. We're going to go into that a little bit more here because out of this same report, the links are on the blog. You can find them there easily. They took a look at local currency versus foreign currency. The red is and the blue are foreign currencies. These are bank loans and those are bonds. But either way, they're both debt. The little green are the local currency debt. Isn't that an interesting thing? Well, look at these are the number of debt defaults. And you can certainly see how large that was uh, as we transitioned into it and even through 2000, 2000. Okay, so we hit a bottom right about here, right when this was peaking. This is in foreign, uh, foreign debt issuance, which means not on soil, right? So China, 
creates all of these US dollar bonds. India, they can do it anywhere in the world. Okay, that's what they're referring to here in foreign currency bank loans and foreign currency bonds. And I want, I want to point out to you, they are spiking. They are going up right now, just like we're seeing government debt defaults move up. They're rising. This is the conclusion from this Bank of Canada uh, report. We conclude that defaults are likely to pick up again over the next decade, giving growing public debt burdens in many advanced and emerging market countries. But the spike is happening here in the advanced economies. Well, who are the advanced economies? Well, Europe is, the US is, Canada's considered that, Japan would be considered that. There's a handful of them. China's not in here, but I'm gonna show you something interesting about China. And to go back to that viewer's question yesterday on the uh, US dollar debt issued by other countries, because just recently, China was hit by the biggest bond dollar, US dollar bond default by a state company, SOE, State Owned Enterprise, in two decades because the Chinese government up to this point would not allow that those bonds to default because it looked bad. But quite honestly, there are limitations. I know that people say, well, can't they do this forever? Well, clearly not. There are limitations because there are limitations in our confidence. Even though people have a tendency to marry the legal money of the state, there are still at some point when they start to recognize the garbage that's going on, confidence is lost. I don't have any confidence in these central banks and I certainly don't have any confidence in the fiat money. When I get it, I convert it into gold, into silver, into water, into food, into energy, into security, into whatever is bringing me more value. Because I know without a little doubt in my mind that I'm not, I'm not nominally confused. I know that the longer I hold on to the dollars, the less and less and less value they have, particularly with the global central banks on a mission to create that elusive inflation that they've been trying to generate and somehow just haven't managed to do it. Although really, you gotta look at your personal bills for insurance, for medical, for food, for energy. Have they gone down or stayed the same since 2008? Nah. Do you think they've only moved less than 2%? Nah. Okay, but Hey, if you remove it, you can make the numbers look however you want. The reason that this is a big concern is because they expect a wave of these kinds of defaults coming right up. And what it really does is it represents a radical shift in the Chinese government's policy and allowing these state-owned enterprises, which are backed by the government, to default on the loans. Now, do we remember that there's, uh, that there's a lot of Chinese corporations that are in mutual funds, ETFs, it's the MSCI index, that are probably, if you've got a pension plan, or you've got a 401k or an IRA, or you hold any ETFs or mutual funds, chances are that you own some of this garbage. I'd take a keen look at that if I were you. Because what they're saying here is this is not an exception. And other local governments with deteriorating fiscal profiles may also see eroding support for their uncompetitive and distressed state-owned enterprises. If I were to transition this to help you see it even here locally, you know, we know that a lot of the high tax states like Illinois and particularly Chicago that have made a lot of promises to their pensioners, well, they, they're a lot of their um, more well-educated and higher paid 
people are leaving the state, which means that that state and that city has lower tax revenues at a time when their, when their pension burden is growing exponentially. Can you see that that might be a problem if you are sitting on municipal bonds that were issued by the state of Illinois or the city of Chicago? Maybe so, maybe you don't see it now, but by the time you know that default has happened, it will be too late to do anything about it. Just keep that in mind because we are facing a wave of US dollar bond defaults. So these are foreigners that have issued US dollar bonds. And I'm just gonna focus on China here, although this is true, uh, well, I don't know that the whole thing that I'm about to tell you is true globally, but it's at least true in China, but globally there's a lot of US dollar bonds that have been issued. Because in, so far in 2019, and that's just through November 25th, so what, two, three weeks ago, something like that, they had already, the Chinese issuers had already issued US dollar debt at the fastest pace ever, period, ever. Now here are those wave of defaults coming because 40% of the China's stress US dollar bonds are due next year. That's just a couple of weeks away, 2020. That's this blue bar right here. So that's going to have an impact on all of those mutual funds, ETFs, even if they hold any individual ones in pensions or they hold it in any other form, that's going to have an impact on the value and the interest rates. And we all know, oops, I always need to keep a pen here, but when interest rates go up, the principal value of the bond goes down. It's okay, Max, I'm good. They see me do it all the time. But when interest rates go up, the principal value of the bonds go down. Now, as long as they can hide that number, then you aren't even aware of it. But this could be the canary in the coal mine, and we could see a domino effect here because everybody is connected. So I don't know. Do you think that this could, could be the trigger for the next global crisis? Yeah, maybe, I don't know, we'll see. But I find it very, very interesting that at the same time that this is happening, China, this is the government of China, mandates 13 banks to issue US dollar bonds. Now they started doing that again, they used to do it a long time ago, but they, they didn't do it for many, many years. And they started issuing US dollar, the government started issuing US dollar uh, bonds in 2017. This is the third issuance of them. But I'm kind of thinking that if you know that you're gonna default, if you know you're gonna declare bankruptcy, what do most people do? They load up whatever credit they have left on those cards. They load it up because they know they're not going to pay it back. And I can't tell you that that's exactly what's happening here. But what I will tell you is I said to myself, especially after the question yesterday, and I said to myself, okay, so I know that they do it, but why do they do it? Now, when they were issuing US dollar bonds when the dollar was weak, well, I understood that because it makes the payments that much lower. But the US dollar is no longer weak. So I couldn't find, uh, honestly, and I dug and I dug, I could not find any you know, authorized reason from the Chinese government as to why they would do it. Uh, I had a couple, I came across a few things that said, well, they could be doing it to open up their bond market, but they have to buy dollars in order to pay this debt. So I'm thinking it's probably more like loading up when they know that the most likely outcome is they're not going to pay those dollars back. Think about it. I mean, I could be wrong. Certainly, I don't know everything in the world. 
you know, but I look at everything and then I come to conclusions. And I'm coming to conclusions because I promised you guys that I would pull up the charts on gold and silver so we could see on spot gold and spot silver. My bad for saying gold and silver. This is not gold. This is a Wall Street product that you're looking at that is specifically designed to, to manage how you think about gold and silver and to keep you away from the physical metal because they know that once it's in your hands, it is out of their view. It is out of their vision and they don't like that. However, having said that, we can see the line of support right here. I probably went a little too fast on that. Okay, we can see the line of support here. Anybody can do this and you can go back as far as you want. Take a roller, pull up a chart, take a roller and draw a straight line. See where it kind of bounced to this level a few times here? There's your support. So when it peaked here and it just came down, this is just a little rest. It's just a little rest and a little test. It bounced off those levels. But what I'm also seeing here is a wedge formation being created. Now, a wedge formation is when you have a series of higher lows and lower highs. And we are pretty much right at the point of this wedge. So, I mean, it could still work a teeny weeny bit. But at some point within the next week, it's either going to break out above it and therefore continue to go up or break out below it. And then we still have support here. So I'll, we'll look at this again um, and we'll see what happens. But I always like wedge formations. I think they're really interesting. This is the silver graph. And you're seeing a series of lower highs and lower lows, but You've got good support right in here. And I would say that silver is right now more in a trading range because you can see the, the uh, resistance here. And that's where somebody asked me, why is silver, you know, around $17 an ounce and can't seem to move out of that range? Well, this is why. So it's either going to break above and then it'll go up and test a little bit more than 18 or it'll stay within this range. Again, we'll take a look at the charts and the graphs, but I want you to understand that the value, the true fundamental value of a physical ounce of gold and a physical ounce of silver is really based upon the most important function that it performs, which is to hold its value over time. Short term, they can do anything you want. What's the cost? 150 bucks to control 500 ounces of gold and 5,000 ounces of silver? Big deal, that's leverage. This is gold and silver that do not exist. It is intangible. In the meantime, all of that QE that they're doing, all of that debt that they're growing, that is actually increasing the true value of particularly gold as the primary currency metal, the primary monetary metal, because when they ultimately are forced to do that reset, they will do it, the fiat, against gold. And that's when you will see gold express, and silver as well, express to its true value. So do not, do not, do not be fooled by Wall Street's product that wants you to stay away from it because a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. They don't want you to know the currency has failed. Though um, one of my precious metals uh, specialists came today because I haven't looked at the purchasing power chart today and said that out of the original dollar, it is now at 0.03, didn't she say 8.5? I think 0.0385, that's well less than four cents and dropping. And the more money printing they do, the less value that these dollars have. And the only reason why they have any value at all right now is because most people still have confidence that they have value. So they're willing to work for it. They're willing to use it as their tool of barter and they're willing to attempt to save it.
well, I got to work for it because I've got no choice. And most of the time, not all the time, I there have definitely been times when I have used my gold and silver as a tool of barter as well. But mostly, I mean, if I'm going to, you know, a, a department store or something like that, I'm not bringing my gold and silver with me at this moment in time. It may not always be true, but at this moment, you know, I'm not taking that. So I have to use those fiat dollars as my tool of barter. And short term, that's okay, because it takes an extra little minute for it to lose that value. But to save it for longer term, for when down the road, when I'm ready to retire, no flipping way would you get me to do it. No way, no how. Because I know better. I know the truth. And hopefully, you watch my videos, you know the truth too. So do we have um, some questions? I mean, can I, do I have some time for questions? You can do one question. I could do one question. Uh, okay, so, okay, if the, um, Jesus asks a good question. So if the world's central banks are the lenders and buyers of last resort, which they are, then what will happen when the central banks default? That's, there's your hyperinflation when they lose control. How will the central banks react? The same way that they're reacting now in money printing, except we'll also have global negative rates because we don't have any choice. Into each crisis, they have lowered rates on average between five and a half and five and three quarters percent. In the US, many, many rates are already negative. And in the US, we've got one and a half percent. So we're looking at global negative rates and that will usher in the absolute, when the US goes negative, that's it. It is more than game over. It is more than game over. So what they'll do is what they're doing now, they're gonna print, 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 print. There's your hyperinflation. That's why they're talking about running hotter inflation because they know that's what's coming. They know that once that genie is out of the bag, not going back in. So uh, yesterday I did an interview with Crush the Street. It was a great interview, I really enjoyed it. And it's not posted yet, but check our social media. And uh, as soon as it's up, I hope you enjoy it too. If you have any more questions about this or anything else, I mean, you can visit our, just send the questions to questions at itmtrading.com or give us a call. We love live conversations and that way you can actually have, you know, go back and forth. If you haven't called us yet, you'll find that the guys and, well, they're men and women that are in the back are all really, really smart and we work together as a team. So we're happy to answer those questions. You can find these images and all of the links on our blog at itmtrading.com forward slash blog, and you can watch the full videos on brighteon.com. Also, if you want to set a time to talk to somebody, just click on that Calendly link below to schedule a call with one of our strategy specialists. If the time isn't available, then call us directly to set up that time at 888-696-4653. And remember, financial shields are made of physical gold and silver. And until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.